Come on, Freedom Church. Come on, let's give God our best praise this morning. Come on, how many believe that today? We serve a God. We believe that today. So God, we thank you for meeting us here. You were already here when we walked into the room today. And God, whatever we have need of, you're more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Come on, somebody. Do you believe that's the kind of God that we serve this morning? We thank you, Jesus. Amen. How many are grateful you came to church today? Man, come on real quick. Let's welcome our Rising Sun campus, our Middle River campus, our Nairobi campus. And those watching online, you picked a good day. Today's a good day. I got props today. You know it's either going to be a good day or a bad day when your boy brings out some props to help him preach. Man, I, I just, there's something special in this place, this, this service. Amen. I'm grateful for our worship team. Thank you for leading us so well. Amen. <clears throat> Are you guys ready to jump into the word today? Amen. Let's do it. I got a lot to read. So just remain standing, if you will. I know we've been standing a lot, but I'll try to hurry. 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Um, I'm reading the message version because I, I like a few words that they use in, for their um, version. It says, Elisha said, listen, God's word, the famine's over. This time tomorrow, food will be plentiful, a handful of meal for a shekel, two handfuls of grain for a shekel. The market at the city gate will be buzzing. But then there's this guy. The attendant upon whom the king leaned for support said to the holy man, the prophet, like, you expect us to believe that? Like sausage McMuffins just falling from the sky. Like trap doors opening up and food just falling out. And Elisha said, you'll watch it with your own eyes, he said, but you will not eat so much as a mouthful. Little grumpy pants. Little saucy Elisha. So it had happened that four lepers were sitting just outside the city gate, and they said one to another, what are we doing sitting here? What are we doing sitting here at death's door? If we enter the famine-struck city, we will die. If we stay here, we will die. Let's go take our chances with the camp of Aram. Now Aram, for those of you that don't know, is the enemy that was camped outside the city and they're now controlling the food supply. The children of Israel are in a famine because the enemy had entrapped them. So these four leopards say, let's go for it. Let's make a move. We will throw ourselves at their mercy. If they receive us, we will live. If, they'll, if they don't receive us, they'll kill us and we will die. And here's my definition of faith right here. We've got nothing to lose. So after the sun went down, they got up and they went to the camp of Aram. But when they got to the edge of the camp, I love this word. This is why I use this translation. The Bible says, surprise. Everyone say surprise. surprise. Not a man in the camp. The master, which is the Hebrew word for Yahweh God, had made the army of Aram hear the sound of horses and a mighty army on the march. And they called one another. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the king of Egypt to attack us so panic they ran for their lives through the darkness abandoning tents horses donkeys the whole camp just as it was running for their dear life so the so the army the four lepers entered the camp and they went into a tent and they ate and drank and they grabbed silver and gold and clothing they went off and hid it these lepers were from the hood <laughs> i would have done the same thing they came back entered another tent they looted it hiding their plunder but finally they said one to another wait a minute we shouldn't, we're having a party with ourselves. This is the day of good news. We're making it a private party. If we wait, wait around here until morning, we're going to get caught and punished. Come on, let's go, tell the, let's go tell the news to the king's palace. I want to come back to verse 4. It says, what are we doing here? I want to preach on this topic today. Church, we can't stay here. Is that all right? We can't stay here. So, Father, I pray that you would use this word. Let us be marked by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 You can be seated. We can't stay here. The great Charles Blondin looked at the crowd of people and he said, who believes that I can do it? And the whole crowd shouted back, we believe. 
Charles Blondin was a famous French tightrope walker who had come over to the Niagara Falls to walk across the Niagara Falls for the first time on a tightrope. And after he crossed it, he crossed it with a wheelbarrow. And he looked at the crowd and said, who believes that I can cross it again with someone in the wheelbarrow? And the crowd shouted, we believe. Is that a good crowd voice? I like it. So he looked at the promoter of the event. He said, sir, do you believe? And the promoter said, of course I believe. That's why I brought you here. No, do you really believe? He said, I really believe that you can put someone in this wheelbarrow and walk across. He said, are you sure you believe? He said, I'm, of course, I believe. He said, okay, great. Then get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> I want to talk about wheelbarrow faith. Because, church, this is what faith looks like. Now, a lot of us, we have mistaken it because we think this is what faith looks like. Now, friends, before you, I have an example of a West Elm special. And if you don't know what a West Elm special, you need to talk to my wife because she lives for West Elm specials. Now, men in, the, in, the, in Freedom Church, I have just ruined your life. This is forever going to mark and change your life. And, but oftentimes we think this is faith. And when I say that we can't stay here, I'm talking about we can't stay here. Because this feels nice. I would sit down, but it messed up my microphone earlier, and I can't do that anymore. They got on to me, right? This beautiful West M, comfortable, standing here preaching four times a day makes my back feel great. Praise the Lord. Very comfortable. Easy on the eyes. Very comforting. Just immediately relieves pressure. This is what we think of faith when we think of comfort and faith. And sometimes, this is how we think of the kingdom of God. I was talking to someone not too long ago, and they're like, Pastor Wade, you know, I, I'm trying to get my, my life back in order. I'm trying to get some things straightened out. I'm trying to get church life back in place. I need some peace. I need a better life. I need some time to heal. And I get it. And oftentimes, God will use the West Elm special for us to get restored and let forgiveness happen in our life and let healing happen in our life. But I don't, want to get, I don't want us to get it twisted. This is a great seat. It's just not a forever seat. Are you with me, somebody? I know without a shadow of a doubt that God absolutely wants to comfort the broken. He will put me in this chair. He will put you in this chair from time to time to get us healed up and to get us better, to get us restored, to allow us to forgive. And when we're really walking through some things and struggling, man, the West Ham special is exactly what the doctor ordered. When life's been really tough, God will put us here. He will for sure get us better. And then he will look at you and say, hey, are you good? Are you better? Are you doing okay? And you will answer, man, I'm doing so much better because I love the West Ham special. <laughs> you like this chair? I love this chair. Are you comfortable in that chair? Oh, God, I'm so comfortable in this chair. Well, uh, I only have so many of these. I've got another chair for you. Well, is it a West Ham special too? No, it's got wheels though. It's kind of cold and creepy. <laughs> because this chair is good, it's just not forever. And sometimes I think we think of faith as a real warm, comfy chair, but in reality, faith is like a wheelbarrow out on the ledge. And when I say that we can't stay here, I want to tell you today that the life that you really want the life that you're praying for, the life that you're believing for, it's not found here. It's not found in comfort. It's not found in a recliner. No, the life that we're praying for is found in a wheelbarrow on a tightrope out on the edge and the ledge, right? It's hundreds and hundreds of feet above water, and I'm going, Jesus, I hate heights, and I don't know how to swim real well. Are you with me? And the Holy Spirit is saying, trust me, because this chair is actually safer than this chair. What? 
It has now been discovered that our main health issue in America is what we call a sedentary lifestyle. We used to be hunters and gatherers a few generations ago. Now we're spending 8 to 10 hours a day sitting in comfort, climate controlled, looking at a screen. And we're now being encouraged to move frequently. Your watch will tell you before the day's up that, hey, it's time to stand right now. It's time to get up. It's time to move, right? Like, I know this recliner, this, this comfortable West Ham special feels good, but it's actually a killer. I know it looks soft, but it's actually a weapon working against you. And in the same way as believers, we can get obsessed with the comfort zone and forget the real place that God has called us to do and called us to be. I want to tell you, it's not over here. It's actually over here. Are you with me, somebody? The old preacher used to say, well, faith and fear cannot coexist. Hallelujah. But what I've experienced is I think they're married to each other. Like, they're like attached at the hip. And the only reason why I have faith is because most of the time I'm scared out of my mind. And I would say that if your life is too small, it's so small that it doesn't scare you at times, you, my friend, need a bigger life. I need faith because of where the Holy Spirit is taking me. Because where God is taking me, my flesh resists it. It's not comfortable with it. It doesn't like it at all. My flesh is most of the time very uncomfortable in the things of God. I'm scared because I know that this is the faith zone. Faith and fear are sleeping in the same bedroom. You have to actually get comfortable with faith and fear at the same time. You just have to decide which one is going to have the authority of your life. Like who's going to make the decision in my life next? At the end of the day, I I feel faith and I feel fear, but which one is leading my life? Am I going to go for comfort or am I going to go for calling? Am I going to go for convenience or am I going to wimp out uh, of, of living my life underneath the umbrella of conviction? I've got to make this decision. Am I going to live small? Am I going to live safe? Or am I going to live a life that is out on the ledge and the edge with God? Am I going to live a life that is actually destroying my soul? Or or am I going to live a big life of faith that my flesh resists but my spirit craves? Whatever we do, church, we can't stay here. Are you with me? I, I know it's quiet. I got the church mouth singing hallelujah and praise the Lord today. You're like, we have, mi- we have mice? We do, actually. We do. We're working on it. In fact, I saw one run right by us a while ago, and I didn't even say anything. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Maybe. The call of God on our life, rising sun, like, we don't care. We eat those for breakfast on a stick. the call of God on our life, sometimes we've got to do it scared. The call of God on my life, sometimes I've got to say it scared. Sometimes I've got to pray it scared. Sometimes we just need to step up and step out. And when we step up, we find God waiting on our step out. Well, well, Peter, what if I step out and and I'm wrong? Well, at least you tried. What if, like Peter, I I begin to sink? Well, you'll be the only person other than Peter in history that ever walked on water. I'd rather get back in the boat drenching wet and looking at John. Yo, bro, where you been? Like Bartholomew, you loser. Where were you at, Judas? I might have sunk, but at least I tried. Church, this is the life of faith. The life of faith in the wheelbarrow. Come on, get in the wheel. Do you believe? then good, get in the wheelbarrow. Second Kings chapter 6, probably one of the most gruesome chapters in the Bible. You can read it on your own time. Um, it's a very dark time in the history of Israel. The people have enough sense, though, in this dark season to call for the prophet of God. And we can learn something from this because I'm learning about my life right now. Like, what do I do when I'm in a spiritual drought? What do I do when I'm walking through a spiritual dark place? What do I do when, I'm, when, I, when my heart is just, 
it's broken and it's under attack. I need to learn, number one, to get under a prophetic atmosphere. Church, we have got to learn how to get under a prophetic atmosphere. When you're in a fight, you better get under an atmosphere that can prophesy you through your storm. You better get under an atmosphere that can prophesy you through your fight. So they go to the prophet and they say, prophet, we need a word. And the prophet comes back and he says, hey, this famine is over. And then I think he thought to himself, Elisha said, this famine is over. And I think he's thinking, "Uh, but is it? Like, I hope it's over. Do you understand? Do you feel the tension? Like it's over right now? Is it over right now? Because I don't see any food. No, it's over because it's over in the spirit. And it has to be over in the spirit before it's over in the natural. Because we serve a God of Romans 4.17 that says, that can call those things that are, are not as though they are. We, we serve a God who can look at dead things and say, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes walking out of the grave. We believe in a God that can say something that goes against what we see and can bring it to pass. We believe in a God, and we sing about it, that can raise the dead, heal the sick, do miracles, reverse the curse, reverse famines, reverse the, te- the attack of the enemy on our life. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. Elisha says the famine is over. I mean, it wasn't, but it was. And many times what God is saying and what you're seeing are two totally different things. God is saying it, but I'm not seeing it. And I have to actually live in the tension of what my God said and what my eyes see. It's uncomfortable, but it's called faith. And oftentimes we don't want to live in a place live in this place, but yet this is the place where most of life happens. Like I got a word from God, I heard God, I said it, and now I'm waiting to see it. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but church, we can't stay here. Sometimes I think we read the scripture and we forget that God uses ordinary men. Like David, he walks up to Goliath and he says, You come against me with the sword and the shield, but I come against you with the name of the Lord. And he takes his stone and slingshot, and in his mind he's praying, oh God, I hope this works. Joshua goes, we're going to walk around these walls, and on this last time, they're going to fall. And in his mind it's like, what did I just say? Elijah says, if the Lord is God... He's going to send the fire and consume these false prophets. And God, I'm going to say this, but you're going to have to back me up. Elisha says this famine is over. I'll be right back. God, I just said something on your behalf that I think that I stepped, I stepped across the line. Like, God, I kind of let the cat out of the bag on how we need to expand our church. How we need to launch campuses. I don't know how we're going to do this, but God, I've said it. I believe that in 2023 that my whole household is going to be saved, but did, what did your kids do last night? You don't want to talk about those details. Like God is restoring my marriage, but did you sleep in the same bed last night? Like I'm blessed beyond the curse. I'm, I'm, I'm the head, not the tail. We hear all these prosperity preachers preach about that, but I know what's in my bank account There's actually a tension where you have to stand on God's word while you're waiting on the miracle. And the prophet, he says, this famine is over, but the servant. (laughs) Did you know that there's always going to be but the servant in your life? But the servant upon whom the king leaned on for support says, come on, you preacher. You expect us to believe this? Like, life is going to get better, really? Like, God's going to do a miracle? Like, are you sure? Like, what, trap doors from heaven? Like, bread is just going to fall down? Do you really expect us to believe this stuff? And I want to say this. I really feel called to say this today. Maybe today, you're struggling from disappointment. And I will say that it's okay to be disappointed. God can work with your disappointed heart 
He just cannot work with a critical spirit. And if you don't deal with your disappointment, it will become a critical spirit. And I will say even this, that sometimes God will even allow your mind to be offended to reveal something that's in your heart. And he will work with a broken heart as long as you don't let that heart go critical. Elisha said, you're speaking from a critical spirit. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to see this miracle, but you won't get to eat of this miracle. God forbid that we get a critical spirit and we stare eye to eye with the move of God and we can't receive it because we don't recognize it as a miracle because we've gotten so familiar and so comfortable in the West Elm special that we can't even be in awe of what God has done and, do, and is doing in our life. And I refuse to have, uh, be a person that possess a critical spirit when I can be a person of faith. And I will say that God didn't call me to be an expert. He didn't call you to be an expert. He called us to be a man and woman of faith. God has called us to be a people who believe God and believe for the supernatural provision of God. And I don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but I do need faith to do what God's called me to do. I'd rather be a chef than a food critic. I'd rather be an artist than an art critic. I'd rather be a musician than a music, you know, a music critic. I'd rather, I'd rather be a church builder than a church critic, someone who sits behind a screen and just taps to be seen and not seen at the same time time we can we can't just stare at a move of God and miss it because we have a critical spirit and Elisha says you're going to miss this and can I just say this by the way you can't stop it you're just going to miss it you can't stop a move of God you can just miss a move of God and let me tell you why this guy didn't care this servant he didn't care because he was in the king's house Y'all, he had a seat at the table. He had the West Ham special pulled up to the table. It didn't matter to him if it was feast, famine, drought, pestilence, or war because the king was going to eat. And this means if the king was going to eat, this guy was going to eat. But it wasn't about the king or the man. He forgot that there were people just right out the city gates that were starving. And the same is true for us. If we're not careful, we can get so comfortable in here that we forget that there are people out there. And let me tell you how you know when you're too comfortable and you've got your West Ham special pulled up to the king's table. Yes, you get critical, but you also just start to chill, eat, and relax. You're spiritually coasting. You stop growing and you start consuming the king's leftovers. All the while, people are starving. 2.8 million people right here in this region right now that need hope. And Freedom Church, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I appreciate and value everything that has been done over this last decade. But in the scheme of things, we've not done a whole lot. I thank God for everything he's done, and I hope you hear my heart. But God forbid we get around the king's table drinking the king's wine and eating the king's meat. And we forget that there are 2.8 million out there at, on the other side of the gate that are starving and needing hope and needing freedom. Most of which who do not know Jesus most of which do not have church life, most of which do not know that God has a plan for their life, that he loves them, and that there's a freedom purpose for them. And every Sunday, and I'm thankful, I'm thankful, man, our crowds are growing, our attendance, we're packed out. We, we, yeah, we definitely need the space, and we're going to talk about that. But we come in here and we say, man, this food is delicious. But can I tell you that it, 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 it really, at the end of the day, doesn't matter how many people are in the room. It's about the people who are not yet in the room. Amen. And we are here right now because of the people that aren't here right now. 
And we have a lot to do. And I never talk about this much, but I've seen so many ministries, people that, that aren't ending well because they fell in love with this seat rather than this seat. Are you, are you still with me? In verse 4, these four lepers are out on the city gate. They're just chilling. And one of them, my spirit animal, said, let's do something. If we sit here, we're going to die. And Fred, you've already lost your hand. Bill, you lost your ear last week. Why don't we have nothing to lose? Why don't we take a chance? Why can we believe God again? And I love this because lepers in this day in society were the lowest of the lowest. And I believe God is like, hey, if the people in the king's house don't want it, I'll go find someone else. God, I will change a nation with somebody. I will change a city with somebody. That's why Jesus said the first will be last and the last will become first. I'll go get a leper if I need to. And we know from theologians that one of the lepers was a man by the name of Gehazi. Gehazi was the servant of Elisha before he rebelled and stole and ended up being rejected and got leprosy as a judgment for God. But it's almost as if Gehazi was saying, I am the biggest screw-up of screw-ups. But I don't have to live in my past forever. And I'm going to die eventually. But if I'm going to die, I'm going to go out swinging. I'm about to breathe my last breath. And I might as well go out doing something big for God. So I don't have to be a prison of my past mistake. Let's go for it. Let's believe again. And I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but I just want to tell you, let's go for it. Let's believe God for the impossible again. I am so grateful that they did not let their inability stop them from their ability of doing something great for God. Because God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. God does not call you because you're perfect. He calls you because he sees something willing in you that says, God, will you use my life for your glory? Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Because I refuse to sit here and die. I can't stay here. Verse 3, we've got nothing to lose. We can't stay here. If we stay here, we'll die. If we go into the city, we'll die. If we go there and they'll kill us, well, we're dead already. And the Bible says that they started moving. And I want you to notice this as the band comes. When they moved, God moved. The Bible, this is probably one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And it was, I think it was part of one of my first messages that I ever preached. The Bible says as they started walking toward the city at night. And I think their leprosy played a role in the time of day that they chose to go. Because they thought, if we walk up into Aram during the day, man, we're four lepers. They're going to kill us. When they see Fred lost his arm yesterday, I lost my ear. Like, my, my, you know, I, I, I've got, I'm, I'm all disfigured. Man, they're just going to kill us right on the spot. Let's go at night because maybe we can cover our weakness. Let's cover up and go in the dark of night. Maybe they won't see where we're weak. And we do the same thing. We're not careful. We'll put on facades, faces, masks. And we live our life for people that don't even matter. When God is saying, I'll take a leper's praise. I'll take a worship from a leper. You give me a hand right now that's missing some fingers. I'll take it. I'm not looking for perfect praise. I'm looking for availability. Church, has always been, it's never been about your perfection. It's always been about your availability. Come on. I'm looking for anyone that will get up and go. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for your best. And when these lepers started moving, God started moving. And the Bible says that as these four men started walking, they're broken down, they're tired, they're weary, they're in pain, they're bleeding. But as these four men walked, the enemy heard an army. The lepers didn't hear anything. 
Oh, but the enemy heard it, which is such good news today. Because faith, faith doesn't need a feeling. Faith doesn't even need a sound. It doesn't need a right song, guys. It doesn't need a clever sermon. All faith needs is movement. You're like, Peter, I don't feel anything right now. I've been in a season where I haven't felt anything. So what? So what? Get up and move. Get up and move. The enemy was scared, but so were the lepers. They were going, man, they might kill us, but what do we got to lose? Let's keep moving. This might not work. Shut up, Gehazi. Let's go. Let's keep moving. And the enemy fled. And when the lepers crossed over the ridge, what did the Bible say? Surprise! I don't know about you, but in my spirit, in my soul, man, I'm praying for some surprises this year. I don't know who I'm preaching to. I feel like somebody needed to hear this word. I'm talking about a surprise. Like, oh my God, look what the Lord has done. I know I shouldn't be surprised because God is amazing, but God, you outdid yourself. How many are believing this year for a surprise from God? Amen. The enemy, they were gone. The lepers go in. They start eating. They start drinking. They start putting coins in their pockets. They start stuffing their undies with Rolexes and Cartiers and Louis. And just being blessed. Because by the way, obedience always brings the blessing. Obedience always brings the food. They're now eating and drinking. Listen, 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 listen. You have to decide where you're going to eat the blessing. But Lord, I just need a break. I'm just tired. Man, we just did so much, Freedom Church, to get where we are. Man, I just don't know if I can, I don't know if I have it in me, Pastor Wade. I, I just want to eat this food right now. <laughs> I just want to eat the fruit of the blessing. It's only been like four or five years since we've been in this building. and It's been ten years since we launched the campus. I just want to eat the fruit of my blessing. It was so hard to get here, and yet I hear a whisper coming from the other chair. And it's the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, come on over. To which I say, I'm not hearing you right now. I'm, I am pushing you out. And the Holy Spirit comes. And he says, hey, remember me? You remember the faith that got you here? Yeah. Do you remember the faith that got you here? That saved your marriage? That restored your brokenness? That restored the joy of your salvation? Yes, I remember that. Let's activate that again. Wait, do you remember where, when your office was your car and you used to drive through and pray over your cities? Saying, God, if you will use me, I will, I will leverage my life. Yes. Do you remember having church in a basement? When on a good day there was 20 people and when you would say greet your guest there were no guests to greet oh Lord I'm trying to forget those days do you remember in your office when I reminded you of a dream of a BMW dealership and there was no way that it could happen but yet five weeks later you held the keys to that building do you remember when in Dallas, Texas at a Starbucks on a napkin I began to download 
vision and dreams. And you went and launched campuses, a multi-site when multi-site didn't even exist. Do you remember those moments? Yes. Let's activate that again. I feel like what the Lord's doing right now, He's kind of looking at us saying, hey, Freedom Church, are, are you good? Are you comfortable? Are you getting healed? I know that church might have hurt you, and I know that church life may be new to you, but are, 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 you, feeling, are you feeling better? You like that chair? God, I love this chair. Newsflash. There's 2.8 million people that don't know Jesus. But God, I want to stay here. But I've got something better. But I've got something new. Church, it's time to find a new chair. Church, it's time to abandon the comfortable again. It's time to run to a fresh life again. So my question is, church, do you believe? Do, do you believe? Freedom Church, do you really believe? Then get in the wheelbarrow because we can't stay here. So let's all stand. And I'll be the first to tell you, Rising Sun, Middle River, online, Nairobi, the season we're about to step into, faith and fear are sleeping in the same bedroom. I've got faith, but I'm scared out of my mind. But I feel the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, it's time to get into the wheelbarrow again. He is calling our church to a new level of faith in which we have never walked in before and my question is do you believe so father right now I thank you for what you're speaking to us God I re we receive this word God we will align our life we will leverage our life for the sake of your kingdom for the sake of your gospel it is such an honor to be called by you to be saved by you but with that calling comes a responsibility. And we say yes. God, there is a yes in our spirit. There's a yes and amen. We have resolved in our mind. We have resolved in our heart that to whom much is given, much is required. So God, whatever you want to do, we'll do it. Whatever you want us to say, we'll say it. We just, we just can't stay there. God, we are leaping, we are jumping, we are running into a life of faith. God, take us above the water. God, get us on the tightrope. Take us to places we've never gone before. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on. Come on, let's put our hands together and let's worship our God.